Hello and welcome back to Tuesday at Dobbs's. A massive thank you, and I really, really mean this, to everyone who gets involved, gets in touch, shares your comments and thoughts, because without all of your opinions, there, there would be no weekly podcast episode. So thank you for sharing all of the comments in the comments section, sending emails with your stories and pictures. Massively apologise, or huge apologies from my side, for not replying to all of them, but I promise you every single week I read every one of them personally, and they're all instrumental in making these weekly episodes, so thank you. Best place to do so, comment-wise and getting in touch, comment section below, or send an email with a longer story to hi at Tuesday at Dobbs.com and Instagram at Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs. I begin. An article my dad sent me. Depressing, eye-watering, and slightly concerning this. This is about car prices, because the problem in the UK, and possibly the rest of the world, is that insurance rates have gone through the roof. And people are now far, far more concerned about taking out big loans, taking out more financial liabilities. So they're, they're far more scared, generally speaking, to take out a big loan for a car. So instead of taking out a big loan, people are looking for older, cheaper, simpler cars, small engine hatchbacks, instead of taking out a big loan. And what that means is that there's now far, far more demand for old, small hatchbacks. So what that's done is hugely push up the price of these, these little, simple, cheap vehicles, turning them into not so cheap vehicles. Have a listen to this from The Telegraph. The average price of a Vauxhall Corsa, for example, which had been £1,136 in 2019, is now up to £2,197. That is an eye-watering rise of 94%. I'll do one more that I found. Really, really scary. If I wanted to buy a 2004 Ford Fiesta today, I would have to pay around £1,707. That is 48, or that is 45% more than the £1,171 such a car would have cost in 2019. You're paying £1,700 for a 20-year-old Ford Fiesta. Coupled to that, and I'm in a WhatsApp group with, with a lot of my friends, all in the same group, every single one of them is saying the same thing. Insurance premiums for some of them are up 85, 100% on last year with no claims on the insurance policies, but everything is going up. Home insurance, car insurance, anything to do or linked with rates is is becoming astronomically expensive. I move on from Virginia. Apologies, I didn't save your name. Freddie, back to the electric bike conversation. And based on what I read today, it might be our last. Harley Davidson slash Livewire reported a third quarter loss of 14.6 million US dollars and said they shipped they shipped 50 bikes for the quarter. That's down 76% versus the same period in 2022, which really was not a big number to start with. I have to think Livewire's days are numbered. You know, it, it brings me no joy at all to see that they're not doing that well, Livewire, because what they stand for is perfectly positive. But when you look at the numbers, I do understand it. If you want the Livewire 1, the original, it's £23,000 and the range is 100 miles. But in reality, I think the range is probably closer to the 90 to 100 mile range. That means that they are only appealing to the very wealthy bikers who only use their bike for commuting because, of course, with a range of, in reality, 90 miles or so, all you can use a bike like that for is commuting because there's no infrastructure for bigger rides and you have to live in a house where you can actually charge it. So that is a seriously tiny demographic Livewire aiming for. Microscopically small, really. They do have one other bike 
the S2 Del Mar. This is their new bike from Livewire. Now this is 17,000 pounds, so it's a good chunk cheaper, but we're still way into the high capacity fuel injected petrol Harley prices here. It's still huge money, 17,000. And it's got a range of 138 kilometers, so that is roughly speaking around 80 miles. So the, re the real range of that, my guess, would be about 70 miles. And that really does turn it just into purely a commuter bike at 17,000 pounds. They're just far, far too niche, far too niche to be able to sell at those numbers. I hope prices come down, but at the moment, the way it is, I, I can't see Livewire's fortunes changing. I move on. Predicting future classics is a game for fools. Or is it? This conversation I was going to end last week, but it took a turn that I didn't quite expect. I'm going to read out a few people's thoughts and opinions here, and it will build to some, to me, slightly changing my mind about the classic bike market. I begin with Edward. The past few years, I've been trying to figure the classic bike market out and which bikes to invest my money into. And I've heard the same thoughts, or I've had the same thoughts as yourself, Freddie, i.e. surely it's a surefire bet to invest in something that's an era-defining icon. So five years or so ago, I bought the first year Africa Twin from Honda, 1998, 650cc model. It's a proper Dakar rally icon with heaps of racing history and with the fairly recent boom in adventure bikes, you would think it would go up and up in value. Edward, let me butt in here. This must be the most surefire bike to be a future classic, because I agree with every single point you've mentioned. I continue, but no, if anything, it's worth less now than it was five years ago, while some run-of-the-mill, pretty bland bikes have risen exponentially. I've just stopped trying to make sense of it, to be honest. It is anyone's guess. I, Edward, I did have a look at this to find out. These are seriously rare bikes now these Africa twins. And they're actually quite hard for me to find one of these. But I did manage to find a lovely condition one. Facebook Marketplace, 1988, the first ever year, 7,250 pounds. Now bear in mind, this is a 35 year old bike that really did help to define a generation. I'm reading here from the classified ad these are robust machines from a golden era, winning four consecutive Paris-Dakar rallies and growing in value. It still turns heads wherever it goes. An iconic bike in very good condition for the age, 43,000 miles, 7,000 pounds. I thought this would be a 15,000 pound bike, Edward. I, I, I'm almost at a loss to understand the market. I move on to James. Freddie, you might study Oh, I like this, James. Freddie might study the old car market for an answer. Right answer? Can't say. I had fun with this, James, because I, I decided to go through a few of... I had about 17 cars when I was younger. Absolute car nut. I, I spent all my money on cars. And I have looked at every single one of my old cars and picked the most common ones that I had and the sportiest versions. Now, these were all cars that I very, very clearly remember dropping down to £1,000. Every one of these you could have bought for £1,000 back when I was about 18, 19, 20 years old. I could never afford the sportiest models that I'm going to mention, but they were all £1,000 and I want to share with you what that looks like. 1997, Persia 106 GTI, that's 11,700 pounds. Or if you want the 1.3 Rally, that is 15,000 pounds. I move on, VW Golf Mark II. Again, you could pick these up for nothing. Now, the exact year that I had, 1990 model, you need 
£14,000, £12,000. I'll do one more for fun. Ford Fiesta RS Turbo 1990 model, £15,500. Shall I do one more for fun? Okay, 1991. Renault 5, 1.4 turbo, 15,000 pounds, and there's another one here, 18 and a half thousand pounds. All I had to do when I was younger, it's very simple, is buy the sporty versions of the car I had, buy a lockup and keep one of each there, and I would now be able to buy a house quite comfortably. This leads me on to something here, because, because, for a lot of you, 60 years old and plus, or and over, motorcycles defined your youth. But for us, for my generation, they didn't. Because bikes were too expensive, the tests were too complicated and expensive, and if you want freedom, if you're around about my age or so, you would buy a car, because you could easily buy a car for 300 pounds. And it was easy to pass your test. You just buy a car, park it outside your house, get your dad to take you out to do the lessons. Your dad then takes you to the test center. You pass. It cost me, I think, I failed first time. It cost me about 50 pounds to pass my test. Maybe a hundred, I can't remember, but it was nothing. And then all your money is focused on buying a car. But with a bike, you've got to pay for all of these lessons. So cars defined our generation. And that's why those prices are completely ludicrous now for those little hatches. I move on to Jezza, Freddie in the late 70s, I was in the market for a new bike, went to a local dealer and they had a used. Get ready for this because this is where the conversation changes. So note these models down if you're keen. They had a used MV Augusta 750S and a Honda CB750, both of which I fancied and were about the same price. I ended up going with the Honda, although CB750s are still bringing good money today. Now I do know this, these are roughly 16,000 pounds, so they do bring good money. I continue. You would be lucky to get change out of 100,000 pounds for the MV Augusta. Do I yearn for either of those bikes? No. I'm just kicking myself for not recognizing what could be worth in the future or what they could be worth in the future. Let me have a look at this. Well, I can tell you these are now so, so desirable that a lot of them say POA, price on application, and they're in lockups along with Ferraris, McLarens, Lamborghinis, and other things. I have found one for sale here and they're rare. 1977 MV Augusta 750S, 145,000 euros. I found a few of these around the US and Europe and it does look genuinely like you need to pay 100,000 pounds for one of these MV Augustas. I move on to 1240 Enzo. Italian bikes and especially Ducatis are a sure bet RE investment or regarding investment value increases. My brother or my brother-in-law late last year sold his mid 70s. It's like it's a coincidence. Sold his mid 70s 750 S Super Sport for around $100,000. He bought the same bike seven to eight years ago and paid $45,000 for it. Basically, given auction results, pretty much any Bevel Ducati from the 1970s is a sure bet investment if you can get one for a good price. Similarly, the Sport Classic 1000 from Ducati, the 848, the 916 Ducati series bikes, also an excellent investment. And I wouldn't be surprised if the same thing happens to the Panigale range of bikes. So my basic point is, it's not all doom and gloom, but you have to choose wisely. Mm, 1240 Enzo, I had a look at this. I wanted to put myself into a bit of a painful situation because I remember when I was looking at my, at my bike, when I was looking to buy my Triumph Speed Triple, I had a 4,000 pound budget. 
And I remember that I saw the Ducati Sport Classics from the exact same year that my Triumph Speed Triple was made, 2005, were in essence the same price, about £4,000. I didn't buy the Ducati because or I didn't consider it properly because I thought, no, it will be just too unreliable and maybe too fragile for me because I know I don't look after my bikes too well. So I discounted this Ducati. And I thought, right now, after you said that, the Ducati Sport Classic 2005 model, let's go and have a look if the prices have done what my Speed Triple has done, i.e. not moved one inch at all. And here on Auto Trader, 2005 Ducati Sport Classic, 13,000 pounds. It's, it's tripled in value. In the same time, my Triumph hasn't moved an inch. I move on to Core GP. I daily, a 2003 Ducati Monster 620. Is that considered a modern classic? Well, I think it's getting there. No rider aids. I got one with 22,000 miles and now has a few hundred miles over 30,000. To be honest, it's been running even better since it hit the 30,000 mile mark. I'm 31 years old, but I'm starting to feel like less is more. I just enjoy riding, but I want to do it affordably on something with modern features and classic looks. You know, it's a really good shout, Core GP. Because these are lovely looking bikes, these old Ducatis. And you can pick up a 1998 620 Ducati like pictured here, amazing condition, Facebook Marketplace, beautifully elegant lines for £2,995, sorry. That's a sub three grand Ducati that looks superb. Moving on, Empty Man. Freddie, you can't go wrong buying a super low mileage, top of the line model Ducati of the 916-996-998 generation. Let's have a look at this then. How true is that? 916 Ducatis. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Auto Trader now. And if you want a Carl Fogarty replica, 916 from 1998, you need to pay 37,000 pounds, or if you're lucky, £30,000. Or if you want a non Carl Fogarty version from around about 98 again, you still need to pay £11,000 for one of those. Moving on. Freddie, I retire. Or oh, sorry, actually, before I get to this one, let me just wrap this up. Future Classics by Italian. I think it's as simple as that. By Italian. Italian bikes seem to be constantly desirable. Future appreciating classics, something I slightly overlooked, more so than the Japanese stuff, more so than the British stuff. People love, in their collections, very clearly, Italian bikes. I move on. Freddie, I retire next year, aged 55, and I have had the same two bikes for over 20 years, so the wife cannot complain about getting two replacements. I currently have a Moto Guzzi, California Stone, and a Suzuki XF650. I had no idea what this bike is. Let me put a picture up of that 650 as I talk, because I, I don't think I've ever seen one. Suzuki XF650 Freewind, both have been great to own and have no real big issues that I could not sort out myself. The picture attached is of the Guzzi at Camping Moto d'Ordoine in France on my way back to Barcelona, cracking campsite with a great bar and owners. I am now after two bikes. I'm five foot seven tall, 29 inch inside leg. And I would like another cruiser slash tourer type and also a new adventure style. I've been looking at the Benelli TRK502 or the 702, but I am stuck on the replacement for the Guzzi as I have had, or as I have, a tad under 
£20,000 to spend on the bikes that will hopefully see me own them for another 20 years. All the best, Max. Okay, so Max, we are looking at two brand new bikes that you want to keep for another 20 years or so. You're five foot seven, so we don't want anything with a ludicrously high seat height. And judging by your cruiser, you're, I have to assume you're a fan of classical, classy looking, elegant, European design, because there's a reason you didn't go with Harley. And then from the adventure style type of bike, you're happy to take slightly, slightly more of a backseat potentially, looking at a slightly cheaper version, maybe a, a 6,000 pound bike or so. So going on everything I've seen from here, let me begin with a replacement for your California. Let's say you spent six grand on the Benelli. That means you've got a budget of 14,000 pounds left. We have to discount, really, Harley Davidson, because you're looking at 18,000 pounds plus for one that you can comfortably go touring on. So I have to discount Harley Davidson. I have to discount Indian. It really does take me down the route of Triumph and the Speedmaster. So you can pick up a Speedmaster for 13,000 pounds. You've then got 1,000 pounds to do a few optional extras. For example, put a rear rack on, get some panniers, get some more comfort related bits and pieces to make it fit for your needs. So I find it almost impossible to look past the Speedmaster. And consider this, Max. Your Moto Guzzi is 1100cc, the Speedmaster is 1200. Your Guzzi's horsepower is 75, the Speedmaster's is 76. Your Guzzi's weight, 250 kilos, the Speedmaster's 263. So in theory, at least on the spec sheet, they're very, very similar bikes. The Speedmaster is also nice and compact, and I think it will suit your, your height very, very well. It's one of my favorite bikes, the Speedmaster. Or how about this, Max? This is a slightly different way of looking at it. So I've never ridden a Benelli, although I have heard quite good things about these. But if you want to consider something else, just to keep it broad and open, you could get a brand new Honda Transalp for £9,700. That's a 750cc with 90 horsepower, 208 kilos. So there is your adventure bike. Now it is heavier than the Suzuki, but I am a fan of those Transalps. And on top of that, yes, you can't afford a brand new Speedmaster from Triumph, but you can buy a 2023 Triumph Speedmaster from Triumph East London for £10,500. Meaning that if you can get the Trans up at a £200 discount, you can get for £20,000 an, in essence, brand new Triumph Speedmaster and a genuinely brand new Honda Trans Alp. How about that? for two bikes. Let me know what you think, and I'd love to hear other people's opinions on the Benelli's as well. Max, happy shopping. Moving on to Jeremy. Freddie, I have relocated to Edinburgh after living on Vancouver Island for the last 18 years. I, I was Googling this, Jeremy. Let me put a couple of pictures up of Vancouver Island. It's a stunning looking place. I'm originally from South Wales and I'll be heading back and forth from Edinburgh to Swansea quite a bit. I only have room for one bike and this is where the challenge lies. I want something that will munch the miles, though I avoid motorways as much as I can, will provide some decent comfort, weather protection and carry luggage. It will also need to be a daily rider that I can filter through city traffic. I love the retro scene, previously owning a T120 in Canada and a 1997 Honda VFR 750 here, but it was too lean forward for me. Having tried a few bikes, I think I need at least 700cc as less than that feels a struggle on motorway speeds. Budget, I'd like to stick to 5k, but I can go to 8 to 9k for the right bike. Thank you. I've come up with a few options, but I'd be interested to see if you come up with the same. Jeremy. 
Okay, Jeremy, I am going to discount Triumph purely because you've already had one. And I'm going to assume that you may fancy a change here. There are two bikes that spring to the top of my mind when looking for these bikes for you. The first of which, Moto Guzzi V7. Not the original V7 with, I believe, a 700cc engine. I'm looking at the newer model 850cc Moto Guzzi. Now this is a bike with 64 horsepower, which is the same as my Bonneville. Perfect amount for motorways. You can do anything, go touring, two up. Great amount of horsepower. It's 233 kilograms, so it's by no means a lightweight, but that new increased engine size and power is meant to be a revelation for the bike. I was pleasantly surprised to find you can pick up a one-year-old Motor Good C V7 stone for £6,795. Now, that, while that's slightly over your ideal price, that's just a one year old bike for such good money. Really brilliant. And this is coming from a dealer in Durham, England, all in black. And you can see how elegantly it holds the panniers. Beautiful looking setup. And Jeremy, there's one more. And I'm saying this because it gets recommended so many times to me. The Honda CB 1100EX. This was, again, never, or again, like is often mentioned by me, this was never a big selling bike, but if you want a bike that can mile munch, commute, be reliable, take people two up or take someone two up in complete comfort, exquisite build quality, then you really need not look any further. It's got 88 horsepower, it's 255 kilos, so it's a proper heavyweight, this bike. But you can pick one of these up, 2014 model, £5,250. This is one in really good condition. Not perfect, but has a few minor scratches on the tank. I'm reading here, you would have to look closely to see these and some slight discoloration on the engine bay. Otherwise, a really nice bike, good chrome, nice paint, saddle is free of damage, tires have loads of tread. Full service history, MOT till mid 2024. Starts first time and of course, 100% reliable, fast and fun. I mean, just look at this bike. Jeremy, this is surely incredibly difficult to argue with. I'm sure that would hit every single box or tick every box. If I had to pick, Jeremy, if both of these were lining up side by side, the Honda and the Gutsy, for your situation, that's Scotland to Wales ride. Knowing you can only have one bike, I think I would side with the Honda, just knowing you've got that extra power and also the unbreakable reliability from the Honda. I think I'd have to go with that. Let me know what you go for. Good luck. Moving on, this is a nice story. The Harley Davidson Heritage Springer that I showed you last week for Bike of the Week well, it was bought by someone who watched the podcast from Martin, Freddie, just today. I agreed to buy the Harley Davidson Springer you highlighted. I've been searching for a while and yes, this one's a beauty. Regardless of its reported ride qualities, it's just art. I'm arranging delivery as I type this. There are a few around, but mostly you'll see them up for sale in Holland and Belgium for some reason. Martin, I found that Germany, Holland, Belgium seem to be the key areas for these bikes. But worry not, Martin, about the potential handling reports, because I've got someone here who is an owner since new and who raves about this bike. This is from Simon. Freddie speaking. Hello, Freddie. It's Maggie, Victor Interiors. Hey, Maggie. Apologies for that. I, I'll cut that bit out because I just had a furniture delivery company call. We've been waiting for a sideboard to go here. And finally, I've been told that it will arrive tomorrow. So I carry on. Uh, Harley Davidson from, uh, from Simon. So Freddie, as you're talking about Harley Springers, I thought I'd send you some photos of my Harley Softail Springer Classic, which I bought new in 2006 
I've toured Europe over the years, traveling as far as Croatia with saddlebags and a windscreen. The riding experience is wonderful with no front end dive when braking, and you always use 50-50 front and rear braking. The resale prices remain high with Germany, a major market for these motorcycles. They will never make them again because, and I didn't know this, you cannot fit ABS to the Springer system. Simon. Simon, this is really genuinely still probably my, my dream Harley. I really, really like these. I move on. MASH motorcycles. This is from Alexander. Freddie, have you seen the MASH? Ooh, the MASH 600, 650. It's 4,600 pounds, built by a small company, and there are a few, only a few agencies in the UK. Okay, I'm on the website now. Here it is, MASH 600, 650 cc. So you get, for 4,600 pounds, this is incredible, a 650 cc engine motorbike, that weighs 181 kilos, which is surprisingly light actually. And I think it's 41 horsepower. So you get a perfectly usable bike that you can do everything on within reason. Looks beautiful. Pea shooter exhaust, spoked wheels. I mean, this is good value even compared to Royal Enfield. It's a lovely looking bike, 4,600 pounds, brand new bike. I need to see if I can test one of those because that, again, will just get so many more people into biking, making biking accessible. Again, if anyone's heard or used or tried a MASH motorcycle, I'd love to know your thoughts on this brand. What are they like in reality? Because on paper, at least, they look brilliant. Bike of the week. Let's, let's do one from your tips here. It has to be Italian for my bike of the week this week. I was looking at Ducati 916s earlier from your advice. These iconic bikes seem to start at about the 10,000 pound mark. And I almost despaired thinking, no, I want to see if I can find something with a bit of, a bit of scope. To, to make a little bit of money on. Can I find one from a private seller? Because a lot of these 916s now seem to be in collections or at dealers, but can I find a private one that's coming in at less money? I've done it. Facebook Marketplace, of course. Ducati 916 in red. Single-sided rear swing arm, gold wheels. Everything looks original, in place, perfect. Under seat exhaust, just so superbly elegant, so beautifully Italian. And I found one for £7,750. Now this was listed four months ago. I guess it's not the type of bike that immediately will sell. So bear that in mind. But it's got, and here's why it's cheap, 29,000 miles on the clock, which for a sports Ducati is high mileage. Totally original motorcycle as it left the Ducati factory, comes with full one year MOT and lots of history. Stunning bike. There you go. Ducati 916 for 7,750 pounds. Surely, I mean, it's a, a bang on classic right now. The only thing that worries me, what a lot of people do say, a bike is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And that has been available for four months. But what a lovely thing for reasonable-ish money. And I'll wrap it up with a thought from David, a 70-year-old biker. Freddie, looking back at the age of 70, it's not the money I might have made that I think of. It's the lifetime of adventure and experiences. Bikes are for riding. I didn't buy my Suzuki GT 750 to make money. I have investments for that. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. Have a brilliant week, all. And I'll speak to you all in the next one. Mm -hmm.